Hi, my name is Dr. Philip Alexander. I'm the host of the World Revolution podcast. And I'm here with uh, Jetty Azuma, who is the host of the Rising Man podcast, founding member of Man Cave, uh, together with Preston Smiles, uh, husband, father, and servant of the Divine Masculine. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, I've I've seen a few of your posts here and there, and I've heard a bit about you, uh, just little bits of information. Uh, and I just, I don't know what it was, but I think it was your energy. Uh, there was just something really honorable about you. Um, and uh, when you connected with me, I was just really like, really grateful. Um, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, you got it, man. Yeah, no, it's funny how these connections happen sometimes. You know, we just different, uh, you know, Facebook and social media will just pop up somebody's face in front of you and you don't know why. But for some reason, it's like, I got to know this person. I've had that happen to me many times before too, man. So yeah, man, honored to connect. Looking forward to seeing what we dive into. Yeah. Uh, well, for me, um, a big part of me understanding people is their life journey because I feel like uh, a person's story in life is actually like the gift of the universe. Everyone has a unique story. It makes this whole world so colorful. Uh, what's your background, bro? And like, what, where did you start your beginnings from? <laughs> depends on how far back you want to go my man um you know i'm i'm a i'm an, I'm an east coast cat i grew up uh, right outside new york city in new jersey um here in the united states and um grew up my my parents are still together they still live in the house that i grew up in um i grew up playing a lot of sports a lot of athletics i was a very shy kid uh very much a people pleaser and a perfectionist so um applied a lot of those learned behaviors into my athletics and my athletic pursuits and also my scholastic pursuits. So I, had, I got a lot of really good grades and I was also an athlete. So I was able to sort of sneak by all of the bullying. I wasn't, I wasn't a dork and I wasn't just the jock, you know? So, um, I went to college to study to be a physical therapist or a physio as you guys would call it out there, I think. And, uh, while I was in college was when I started to really begin asking some questions about my spirituality, about existentialism, about what the fuck is life all about. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, that led me down some paths of studying some Buddhism, beginning to meditate, um, going to Burning Man <laughs> in my early 20s, and uh, essentially realizing that I was going through a lot of avoiding who I was and facing who I was and taking a look at the things I didn't want to see about myself. And I was hiding behind uh, smoking marijuana, smoking cigarettes, uh, being very social and not very authentic with what was really going on beneath the surface. And so I had some uh, life events that occurred. I got arrested when I was 23 years old for smoking weed in New York City. And you know I was the good boy up until that point my whole life. Now, I don't even think I ever had detention in school. And so here I was, here I was sitting in a cell next to some people who were like, you know, being arrested for weapons charges. And I'm looking left, I'm looking right. And I'm saying, wow, is this who I am? No, nah, can't be. And so um, that combined with some other um, uncomfortable conversations with family members and things that occurred in my life all led me to who am I really? And I'm not spending, spending my time doing the same things with the same people who have always known me is not helping me see who I really am and discover who I really am and what I'm here for. So I set out on a journey to find out who I was and to find male mentorship. And that's what led me to California where I live now and into all of the work that I do now. But that's the sort of the abridged version. Yeah. What, what, why do you think we're here, bro? Like at, on a soul level, why do you think we're here? Why do I think we're here? Yeah, why did, why did the universe send you? Mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't, uh, I used to spend a lot of time in that sort of esoteric uh, philosophy type of thing. But, you know, since I've had a son, since I've been married, and since I've been really doing some work like c concrete on the ground, I don't spend too much time up there. You know, if you ask me what I think we're all here for, I think we're here for the children. And if I trace that back to your question, I think our, our whole purpose here is to provide our children with the best lives and the best opportunities we can so that they can better take care of themselves, each other, and the planet. So if you ask me why are we here, I think we're here to take care of each other and take care of this planet. And um, I also think that there's parts of our existence that aren't so happy-go-lucky too. 
you know i mean if you look at nature nature is not all rainbows and butterflies it's nature is fierce nature is violent you know so i think that um humans we have a very distorted perception of reality sometimes and so uh, you know, when we get into esoteric conversations I, I always like to bring it back to nature and say hey there's animals out in the world that are tearing each other to pieces right now right what is that how does that fit in with with all of this peace love and happiness you so, so your your perspective on life has always been that way oh man my perspective on life changes all the time you know i, I can't say no my life my perspective on life has not always been that way um I'd say some critical moments when that shifted for me have been becoming a father, definitely, um, having a child in this world, um, finding what I wanted to invest my time, energy, and resources into as far as purpose and follow what re the reason why I believe I'm here and the work that I feel called to do right now. Um, but no, man, my, my perceptions of the world change all the time. I'm, co I'm constantly open to new possibilities of, of what we're here for and what we're doing. Hmm. You, you talk a lot about um, the divine masculine and uh, the, the difference between a boy and a man. What does that mean? <laughs> it's funny you say the divine masculine. I, honestly, man, I don't really use that terminology too much. I do love to talk about masculinity, but divine masculine is something to me. I don't, those words don't resonate for me. But okay. masculinity itself, um, I think masculinity is a word that describes a series of characteristics and qualities that every human possesses, um, just in different proportions. So for me, masculinity is fire, it is focus, it is determination, willpower, and drive. It is strength, it is, um, it is concrete, it is certain. And, uh, and you know, the contrast to that being feminine would be the creative, the artistic, the flow, water, things that move without specific strategy but more by intuition so for me that's what masculinity is and i do talk a lot about the comparisons between boy and man um especially on my show because yeah. i think it's a very archetypal every every man every every boy in in some way wants to become a man he's told that's what his journey is all about and i think that is part of every boy's journey is to become a man so what are the differences? Some of the, some of the repeating topics that come up around this conversation are that a boy thinks the world is there to serve him. And a man realizes that he is here to serve the world. A man takes responsibility and accountability for all of his actions and for everything that happens of him, from him, and to him. He takes responsibility for, whereas the boy looks to uh, attribute responsibility to anything but himself. Um, so is that, would you say that's with every child that grows up, that's always the way that um, they, they see things in life that way? I believe so. I don't think that there's a timeline on that. I think some, some boys cross the threshold into manhood at a very early age for whatever reason. Maybe they were raised by a single mother and they didn't have a father figure and they were, you know, they were the man of the house, quote unquote, and they were raising their younger siblings. I know plenty of boys who are in their fifties and sixties because they've, they've just never learned how to stop making it about themselves. And the other thing I'll say is crossing the threshold into manhood doesn't mean that we can't revert back to boyish behaviors and that we can't still express boyism. And another important distinction is that boyhood is not bad. Boyhood is creative. It is playful. It is fun. Manhood is more serious, more driven, more focused and directed. And so I like to think that there's a boy that exists in every man. There's not always a man that is sheltering a boy, though. You follow? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Uh, I, I when I when I think of the boy, I I feel like there's a there's a feminine energy to it. Uh, it's a a vulnerability to that as well. Uh, because in my life, I I would say my father he was very a uh, very much a man, but he would uh, always suppress his emotions. Uh, and for me, I'm actually, I would say I'm probably more of a boy, but uh, evolving into a man, but still staying true to that. Uh, because I, I don't think that, um, I mean, I guess that's the way that I experience life in that way. Yeah. Well, there's, I think it's really important to say that to be man doesn't mean to not be vulnerable. To be, I think one of the most masculine things to do is to be really vulnerable and, and, and genuine and transparent. For men, for us men, it can be difficult because we need really safe spaces in order to do that. 
in order to share what our pain, our challenges, our struggles are really like, there's a, there's a very specific space and sacred space that is held where men can do that together. And that's how I hold that belief. I'm not necessarily saying that that is the truth, but I think one of the most masculine things that a man can do is to be vulnerable with his brothers, to, to bear his soul. And I think that this you know, generational lineage of machismo and suppressing your emotions, yes, that's something that we get to, we get to shift. We get to, we get to teach our young men how to, express your, how to express your emotions and to have them, not to ignore them, how to have them and express them. And to, and to access the power of your emotions, but not to be led by them. I think that's a more feminine quality. I think women, feminine, not, not necessarily women, but the, femen- the feminine energy is led by emotions. Yeah. Masculine and feminine experiences emotions. The feminine is led by them. And there's a beautiful element to that, to be led by emotion, to be steered by the ebbs and flows of the ocean. To me, that's just not masculine. Right. Well, yeah, I, um, I watched a, a podcast interview with Aaron Harris. I love that. Uh, it was all about heart connection. Uh, how does one uh, fall into this place of vulnerability? Because uh, for some reason, uh, it's the hardest thing to do sometimes. Uh, it's like our mind just doesn't want to do it, but it's the only place where you could really truly feel free because you have nothing to hide. Mm-hmm. Well, you said, how does someone fall into vulnerability? I, I don't know. I, I think someone chooses vulnerability. And, and, and in order, how does someone find the place in which to choose vulnerability? Well, that's my mission, brother. <laughs> my mission is to create spaces and to create opportunities for more men to do that because I believe there's not enough of them. And uh, I, I think of all different types of ways that men can find that. You know, you, all, all it really takes is finding someone who's willing to listen and listen and listen without judging, without judging what your truth is. And there's a, um, an, 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 a nonverbal experience that happens of knowing that you're being received and listened and heard by someone without being judged, without being made to feel less than that occurs, that allows you to go deeper, that opens up the portal to your truth. You follow me? Yeah. Yeah. And so how does that happen? It's, it's, it's equal parts of the, the person who's willing to give the truth and the other person who's willing to receive it. It has to have, it has to be reciprocal. Right. And uh, why do you think it's important? Like uh, what, what, what gifts are birthed out of that? I mean, for me, man, that's everything. If we're not being truthful, then what are we doing? We're just, we're creating visages of what we want people to see. We're creating stories that we want people to look at so that we can gain approval and gain favor of people so that we can exist in a world without being bullied or made to feel stupid. But if we're not living in our truth, then why are we even really here? It's one of the most painful things we can do. It's probably the root of all addictions, the root of all depressions, the root of all anxieties is not being fully expressed in ourselves. So why is that important? I mean, I could, I could probably give a litany of reasons why, but it, it, when it comes right down to it, if, I, if you can't trust that I'm giving my truth to you, that I'm giving you who I really am, then can you really trust me to do anything? Can you, can you, can you depend on me? Can you trust me to take care of you, to take care of your family? And you know, going back to why we're here, trust is so important. And I believe that you know, trust and trustworthiness is deeply connected to truth. You know, they come from the same root word. <laughs> what, is, uh, what is God to you or the universe? You know, my, my spiritual philosophy is, con- philosophy is connected to the elements. Uh, it's a very indigenous perspective of reverence for the earth, for the, for the air, for the water, for the fire, for the animals, um, for, all, for all beings. So in that way, when you say a word like God, for me, God is something that it's, it's that which unites all of us. You know, to say that we're each a piece of God means that we're all a piece of this living, breathing organism. So um, God, to me, is the way in which we can see ourselves in each other and in everything. That's what I got. What, what, do, you, uh, what do you feel about uh, unconditional love? What is that? 
uh, well, you know, the, <laughs> the very nuts and bolts definition of that is loving without condition. So when we're, you know, the opposite of that, of, of unconditional love, loving with condition means I'm loving you until dot, dot, dot. I'm loving you until you betray me, or I'm loving you until you prove that you're not worthy of my love anymore. To love without condition is to, is to just love. No barriers, no blockages. Um, I think it's a, very, it's a very special kind of love. I don't think about that a lot. And that's not, unconditional love is not a word that comes up in my uh, vernacular very much. But I think about unconditional love, I think about my, my son. I think about my, my children. There's, there's a very, do you have children? I don't, I'm not, I'm not married. I'm single. Okay. Okay. Well, um, there, there's something very special that happens. It's actually, my heart's lighting up right now because my, my best friend in the world just gave birth to his first child last night. And uh, I was just talking to him right before this, we got on here actually. And there's a, there's a moment, there's a crystalline cellular shift that happens when your first child is born. And to me, that's unconditional love. And it's, uh, it's ineffable. It's difficult to describe. And uh, if, you, if, if you have the privilege and honor of being a parent, and I'm sure you'll know what I'm talking about. How did you, because your wife is actually, uh, she's a powerhouse as well. Uh, mm. She's doing some amazing things. How did you meet her? Well, going back to my, my brief intro overview, when I decided to leave New York and travel west, I, I, I dipped into many different places. I spent some time on the uh, Diné Reservation um, with, with some of the Native folks, and I went to, I was at Burning Man, like I said. I've been going for five years in a row and travel. I did Vipassana meditation. I, I, was, I was taking everything in that I could because, like I said, I wanted to discover who I was. And at the tail end of this four-month journey, I landed in Ventura, California, which is just uh, about an hour north of L.A. And I was spending some time with um, one of the first men that showed up in my life as a mentor besides my father, a uh, man by the name of Mark Bass. Um, good, good friend, good brother. Um, still meet, meet with him every couple of weeks. And he invited me to stay with him. And at the time, he offered me a little bit of work. I didn't have much money. I, I had saved money, and then I had spent most of my money while I was traveling. So while I was spending time with him, he was mentoring me in a lot of the personal growth and development uh, terminology and history and uh, technology. And while I was with him, he said, hey, you might as well uh, meet Carrie. You know, she's, she's someone else who's really interested in the types of things you are. She wants to build community, and she's a younger person in this circle of mostly 50 and 60-year-olds. So maybe you guys will have something to talk about. And so um, that was how we connected, was through mutual, mutual acquaintances. Cool. And, and it, it, it took me traveling 3,000 miles across the country to find her. Right. So, and, and I feel like she's very much a mirror for yourself, isn't she? Is she a mirror? For, oh, absolutely. I mean, in the sense that every day she's mirroring back to me how I'm showing up in the world. You know, there's no, there's no more honest of a mirror. Well, I don't know. One of the most honest mirrors in the world is your intimate partner, if they have the ability to be very honest. And since we're both in the personal development space and we both care about growth, it's actually one of our three pillars of our family. Uh, we, had a, we had a date one night. We, we sent our son over to stay with the grandparents, and we, said, we just had a beautiful dinner and realized that we didn't have shared family values that we had declared and spoken out into the world. So we spent the night just talking about what do we really value, and one of our values was growth. So of the, of the three values that we have, service, spirit, and growth, growth is something we're always committed to. So yes, I mean, just, just being in a relationship like that where you, we both value something that highly I get to look in the mirror a lot and it ain't always pretty. <laughs> it ain't always pretty. Um, but it's, it's valuable and it really helps me and serves me to grow. We, we do that for each other every day. Uh, I'd like to uh, go back to this uh, little bit to this esoterical uh, talk. Um, it's, it's some, it's a place where I uh, tend to put a lot of my focus on. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's for some, uh, for, for me, like, I've always wondered before I was born, where was I? And uh, what am I doing here? Um, I grew up uh, going to church, uh, reading 
stories in the Bible. Uh, as I started to spiritually develop, uh, I started reading about other religions as well. And uh, there's all these historical stories from, uh, from thousands and thousands of years. On some level, there's, there's, there's truth in everything. How accurate that is, I don't know. Uh, but they must have occurred. Uh, and because we are one with everything, uh, perhaps we were there when those things happened. Uh, so for me, uh, delving into that realm, uh, I, I do it because uh, it gives real meaning into what it could mean for me to be here at this moment. Uh, because there's something special happening on the planet. Uh, and there's all of these, especially I would say in the last five to ten years, it's completely different to what it used to be. Like people, are, I'm starting to see people just come up out of, out of nowhere and speak their truth about love and truth uh, and how we can actually work together and uh, do something positive for the planet. Uh, yeah. It's not always been like that. Um, and there is also talk about things on another level which talks about going into dimensions uh, enlightenment, that this might be a period, uh, perhaps, that we're all uh, enlightening to discover who and what we, we might be. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll be very honest with you, man. Um, eh, probably when I was in college, like when I, when I told you that story about when I went to college and I started to dabble with spirituality and starting to ask questions, I would have a lot of fun. Um, delving into these esoteric topics because because it's boundless it's endless you can philosophize about our experience and why we're here and, and playing around in that space forever and i had so much fun with that it was so valuable to me and my maturation and development of who i am today because i gave myself the freedom and i had a community in which we were actively exploring what it was to be here um through our conversations, through our social interactions, through going to Burning Man, through psychedelics, through experiential living. And <clears throat> what I've come to take away from that type of conversation is that it, it often ends up in the same place for me. It often ends up in uh, a bunch of words and hypotheticals that I can't prove, that I don't need to prove, and whenever I get up, like way up into the clouds in that space, I bring it back to, well, what, am, what can I actually influence that's right in front of me? If I want to, if I, if I really want to look at my life and why I'm here, like, you know, why everyone's here, I don't know. I can't tell you why you're here. I wouldn't try to. That's not my right or my privilege. I could tell you why I'm here and I could tell you what I can influence right in front of me. And that's what's become more valuable to me is to be able to focus on what's right in front of me and what is what is tangible and what I can influence because there's so much of life that we don't have control or power over. We may think we do, but we don't. And so I've I've chosen to focus my attention on what what can I put what what can I influence? And I do believe I do believe that there is a an awakening. I do believe that there is a, a shift, you know, a lot of shift is another word a lot of people like to use happening, what it's connected to what it means where it's coming from what it has to do with our chakras or you know, the seven, whatever's, I, I don't spend too much time in that space, because it's not that useful for me with what I'm up to right now. Well, that, that's my what, what are your thoughts on uh, things like law of attraction and uh, this, this idea that perhaps everything's connected and we have a vibe that we put out that attracts everything into our life. Mm -hmm. I think there's a merit to that because I've, ex I've experienced that in my life. I've, I've seen the evidence of that, of, of having a strong intention and being committed to it. I think that as long as you're committed to something and something that really matters to you and you direct your attention to it, that it will happen. It may, they may look different than you imagine, but it will happen. Right. So, um, you know, so the, the law of attraction, absolutely. We, we attract to ourselves what we put our attention on. That's, that's what I believe. And we, one of the superpowers we have as humans, in my opinion, is we have the ability to create a story around grounded, hard facts. Like the, what's actually happening in front of us, we can tell a million different stories about, and it will make us feel a million different ways. So I think that that is something we do have power and influence over is what we attribute to what's actually happening, the meaning that we give it. One of my mentors calls humans meaning-making machines. We like to just put meaning on things. Oh, 
Did yeah. you drop me? No. Oh, I'm am here. I still here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was weird. Sorry. Hold on a second. Uh, okay. Yeah, it just popped up another window. My bad. Um, yeah, we just we just we put meaning on, on things. We attribute meaning to everything that's happening in in our in our experience. And so, um, so yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of my my experience of that. So so you're you're more practical in how you do things, aren't you? <laughs> I think that's I think that's a fair assessment of me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I, w I definitely consider myself a spiritual person. Um, I, I I practice a lot of uh, spiritual ceremony and spend a lot of time in nature and in communion with nature and the elements. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't. I wouldn't consider myself a, like a yeah, like the going into the esotericism of life isn't where I tend to spend my time now. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, well, I feel like I, my experiences, uh, so I'm, I'm like seeing things from that perspective. Because uh, for me, I've had personal uh, experiences where I'd just be walking around in the park and um, there'd be moments where I do feel completely one with everything and I'm not in my head. Uh, and when that happens, uh, it's it's almost like anything becomes possible. Uh, you literally do become one with everything and you do acknowledge and you know that you are actually one with everything. Uh, and there's something so powerful with that. It doesn't matter. And I think, uh, as you said, it's very important to, to focus and to stay grounded. Uh, but there is so much magic out there that is, is real. Uh, that I feel like a lot of people just, um, you know, disregard. Uh, <laughs> or maybe mm -hmm. not disregard, but maybe it's a bit out there. Um, but, you know, there are things where uh, masters in the past used to do um, metaphysical crazy things, levitation or even uh, just be one with all of those elements. And I'm sure mm -hmm. you've met so many of those people. Um, I've, I've heard through some of my mentors as well. They speak of people like, uh, I won't mention names, but, um, yeah, that, that can do those kind of things. Um, again, it's not important. But, um, well, this is fascinating. Let's, 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 exp let's, let's play around here for a minute because clearly, clearly you and I have a little bit of a different perspective of where, where our attention <laughs> goes. Right. Yeah. And that's cool. That's, that's great. I, I'm actually really enjoying this. So let's see where we can find the common ground because like you said, if we're, if we're all experiencing oneness and it's all, we're all universally one, then all we're doing is we're looking at the same thing from a different angle. Right. So when you say something like, like these, um, these metaphysical miracles that people are performing and levitation to me, I look at that and I say, yeah, that's a good, that's a great reminder of what humans are really capable of. I, I'm, I'm sure there's amazing things that happen that we know of and things that we don't know of. And I love to be amazed and astounded by what humans can do and what we can create. And I do believe that we live in such a small fraction of a percent of our potential that when we see people doing incredible things, that's why we love sports and athletics. When you see LeBron James dunk from the free throw line, I'm like, wow, humans can do some amazing things. They have YouTube channels dedicated to humans being amazing. I think there's actually a channel called like Amazing Humans or something like that. And so I love that stuff because in, in a very, in, in kind of a different context, it reminds me that anything is possible. That experience you have when you walk through the park and you experience oneness and infinite possibility, to me, I experience that too. And whatever the reminder is, awesome. You know, if it happens because you're contemplating the veins on a single leaf that fell from a tree and you imagine what it took for that single leaf to fall from that single tree and how long that tree, what is that tree seen? Like, you, yes, I, you, know, you, can, you can go deep and you can get, and that, that may illuminate possibility for you. To me, it's like whatever it is, because I see, I see possibility when I, when I cuddle my son at night. Like the other night my son woke up and he wanted me to lay in bed with him and I just like smelt his hair while I was lying in bed next to him and I was like, wow, damn, anything is possible. Like it, that, that's, that's where I see the common ground in what we're, what we're talking about right now. Uh, one of the, uh, my philosophies in life that I adopt uh, is this, um, 
is this idea of humility. And, and what, uh, my philosophies of thinking is that there are, and it comes from my religious background as well, I would say, but um, there are all of these different vibrations that make up the love that God is. Uh, one of them would be humility, uh, faith, understanding, uh, compassion, mercy, uh, forgiveness, um, and surrender. What, what is your definition of humility? Hmm. My definition of humility. That's a great question. I haven't thought about that very much. I don't, I don't often, here's another thing about me. I don't often define things in words. I like words, but there's some things that to me just, I can, I can show you humility. I can, I can point it out in a crowd, uh, <laughs> but to put it into words is, is a little bit befuddling. Um, you know, aside from, aside from the standard definition of what humility would be, I think to be humble is, goes back to that definition of what I said a man was. And when I say the definition, the distinction between a boy and a man, you could easily insert girl or woman. Or you could just say the word adult. The definition of an adult for me is someone who's capable of making, the, making it about everyone except besides himself, about taking myself out of the center of things, away from being the focal point, away from looking for what is in it for me. To me, humility represents that that quality that someone has to look for the opportunity to be of service, trusting and having faith that everything that all of my needs are going to be met anyway. Mm -hmm. And that if I'm simply here to be of service and to be helpful and to be useful to others, that I'll be taken care of anyway. Mm -hmm. So to me, humility lies within that. And I can, I can name off a lot of people who I've seen be very humble and who I would consider to be very, uh, to have a lot of humility. Um, I think it's often the person who's the who's willing to listen too. Especially uh, nowadays, man. So many people want to talk so much, including me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I come from a country, Australia, where uh, this is what Preston actually mentioned. I went to the Bridge Experience, and um, he he spoke about how Australians have this tall poppy syndrome, where it's mm -hmm. like if you're a bit too proud. Uh, we actually pull it back a bit. And Americans are very confident people. It's just the, the cultural thing of things. Uh, my, my perspective on humility, um, again, it's, it's probably up there somewhere where uh, I see that or I acknowledge the fact that everything in our reality is actually us. Uh, so we actually have no choice but to learn from anything, whether it's actually even like a speck of dirt on the ground, whether it's you're looking at a tree, you're looking at even a wall. Uh, there is information that's always like present in front of you. And if you don't have that willingness to learn and listen and observe, you can't extract that information. The universe is always uh, open to giving you and flowing to you. Yeah, that to me, that's, that, that aligns exactly with what I believe is if, if we're not willing to make ourselves l as important as everything around us, <laughs> then, then we're missing the point, right? If we, if we don't have the ability to, to slow down enough to appreciate everything else for all of its beauty and brilliance and glory, then, then we're missing that. So in what you said, to me, it's the same thing. I, I hear a lot of the same thing. That, or at least it, reson it resonates <laughs> for me. Um, and when you, you know, going back to the tall poppy syndrome and confidence in Americans, there's, you also have to be capable of penetrating the bullshit. Like you got to be able to look through, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people. I've seen a lot of people, people that I know personally, I won't mention names like you didn't, but a lot of people I know personally show up on social media as somebody with a lot of information, a, a loud voice, something to offer a lot to say and then you put them behind closed doors in a really safe vulnerable space and they break down and say they have no idea what they're doing they're the least confident person in the room you know so interesting how um and i was just in australia in november i love australians i love aussie culture because i think you guys are just so funny and so big-hearted um and you, you, you call things how they are. And here, here in the States, at least in this part of the world where I've grown up, a lot of people were very good at disguising the truth. And I think that that's why that's become so important to me is because I've experienced the freedom 
of being very truthful, of exposing my ugly, what I thought was ugly, and seeing that there's still people who love me on the other side of that and finding out that ultimately it's me who has to love myself in what I perceive to be ugly because no one else really cares. <laughs> you spoke about uh, tr- what, what is truth for you? Is that, is that vulnerability? Is truth vulnerability? Uh, so I, I, think to be, I think to be vulnerable is to be truthful. And when you ask me what is truth, truth is, <laughs> I mean, what's, what's really there? It's the thing that you are compelled to say, whether you say it or not. So you've probably been in this, in this situation. I'm sure anybody who's listening has been there before. When somebody asks you a question and the answer immediately comes to you, but you hold back from it, that's truth. It's truth that wants to be told. Or maybe you're a person who is a little more confident, doesn't really care what people think. You're not looking for validation. And as someone asks you a question and you share your truth. Or if you're in, like a, in a circle where we're going a little bit deeper, like what's your biggest fear? The biggest fear that comes up, the first one that makes you, gives you a somatic response, like makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up, makes you feel nauseous, makes you feel like you have to go to the bathroom. Do you share that? Because that's the truth. <laughs> well, I, I, I guess uh, uh, at some stage, that's probably the level of truth we'd have to get to. <laughs> Well, I, and here's, here's the funny thing for me, man, is like, it, what, what, is, what are different levels of truth? I, don't, I, I think it's, and this, is, this probably goes back to who I am and where I come from. In, in masculine work, in men's work, in masculine work, it's like, hey, let's keep it black or white. Is it the truth or not? Fair enough. You know? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that, because I think that that's a very slippery slope to say, oh, okay, well, I went like two layers deep into my truth, but there's still like 10 more layers to go. <laughs> and I, I know that it's a journey, believe me. I, I'm just human like everybody else. There's still things that I have a hard time revealing and sharing. The more that I do it, the, the more, more freedom I experience. Well, uh, what's your uh, idea around surrender? Surrender. <laughs> you're, throwing around, you're throwing around a lot of $50 words today, man. Surrender. What is surrender about? Um, <laughs> These are the philosophies that I adopt. So. I love it, man. I love it. And, I, and I, hope that, I hope that I'm not offending you with how I'm responding to them because it's just, this is a very different conversation that I'm used to having. And I think it's, it's probably very interesting to listen to for whoever's listening. At least I'll, I'll be interested to go back <laughs> and do it. Um, and it's cool, man. I t- by the way, I totally honor your, your belief system. One of the things I learned from that mentor that I stayed with in California, but right, the one who introduced me to my wife, is that everyone has space to have their own truth. And you know, the, the one universal thing that exists within all religions and spiritual faith systems is to, to like the golden rule, right? To, to love someone the way that you want to be loved, to treat someone the way you want to be treated. So if I honor your truth, and you, have, you give me room to have mine, then we can be in communion. We can be in relationship. So just to be clear about that, man, I totally love where you're coming from. It's just it's a different conversation that I'm used to having. So when we go back to surrender, what does surrender mean to me? I think, I think there's a lot of power in surrender, to be honest with you. There's actually a guest on my show, former UFC champion, like, you know, kind of the, the guy you wouldn't want to mess with, but has since um, adopted a very spiritual um, path and, uh, is in communion with plant medicines and all that. He came on the show and we were talking about surrender. He said, the most powerful thing that a man can do is surrender. And I think that I was like, interesting. We talked about that surrender in that conversation came up as um, finally relinquishing control over the things that we don't, con- that we don't control. Giving ourselves up to, I guess, higher power comes into that conversation, you know, and, and actually humility comes into that as well to humble yourself enough to recognize that I am not the almighty. I am not the alpha or the omega. I am a human being just like the man in front of me and the man beside me. Um, to me, that's, to me, that's surrender. I don't think the surrender, a lot of times we think of surrender as giving up. Um, but in this context, I think it's just, it's just giving up control. And uh, to me, that's actually very liberating. Yeah. 100% feel that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got around the questions that um, some of the, well, this whole conversation has been interesting in that way, but um, <laughs> what, what are your, uh, what is your understanding of aliens? Do they exist? <laughs> aliens. Um, I think that, I think we would be naive to think that humans are the only quote unquote intelligent life forms. 
out there. Um, I also don't think that humans are the most intelligent life form, to be honest with you. I think that we're, we're, we still have very much to learn. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure there's other beings out there in the universe. I'm sure that I do believe that our ancestors had, have had communication and contact with other life forms. Um, in my days where I used to smoke a lot of weed, I used to philosophize and think about what aliens might have done and, and what this era of humanity might be all about. And sometimes I would think, well, maybe they're doing an experiment. Maybe they're seeing what, 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 what are humans capable of without the direction of higher intelligence? Where will they, will they, will they ultimately come to you know, discovering that it's, it is all about community and doing it together and it's not about competition. Will they, will they find out? Tune in next week for the, you know, for the next episode of Humans on Planet Earth or something. <laughs> like they're watching us all over. Um, I'm sure, man. I mean, to, to answer your question really, say, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's other life forms out there. We can call them aliens or whatever we want to. Do you, uh, have you been here before? In terms of past lives, reincarnation, is that a belief that you have? Will you entertain? Yeah. Well, what's funny about me, man, is I, I dance back and forth between the scientific and the spiritual realms quite a bit. Um, so in a scientific sense, my cells are, have coalesced into a human form right now. And these cells have existed as something else beforehand. They, you know, they, they came up and emerged in my parents and then I popped out of my parents and here I am now and then I'll return back to a different form. So I do believe I've been here before. Do I think I've had a past life as a human? I actually do because I have had ex experiences and journeys with medicines that have shown me glimpses of lives that I can't help but explain. And I think a lot of it is coded in our DNA. I don't know if it's my past life or it's my past life just because it's the DNA of my ancestors or some other people that I've been connected to. But I absolutely believe so. Um, and I know there's a lot of people doing some really great work. Have you, have you heard of Domineur no. and the folks out in Italy? Um, it's a really amazing community. I, we had the, I had the fortune of, of um, having a very small, intimate workshop with some of my closest friends about, about a year ago where um, somebody from this, uh, this community that has lived and thrived in Italy, they do a lot of um, very, very deep work, like, you know, celestial type of work and like you know traveling between time and past life regression things so those folks will tell you that absolutely everyone has had a past life it's just a matter of whether you remember it or not your um your background is is there any aztec uh uh yeah background to that culturally no man my my mother's family is from italy and um you know parts of my 23 and, and me tell me that there's some Middle Eastern ancestry there, but my dad's family is 100% Japanese. So, oh, wow. uh, so that is it's my an makeup. Interesting mix. Yeah. <laughs> it is an interesting mix. I mean, yeah, sushi pizza, and my uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, but but I do I do have have aligned with the Native American Church and that spiritual trajectory. So I I, I study and and. Um, I study a lot of those ways. I'll leave it at that. All right. Uh, what would you tell yourself as a 20 year old, if you could go back in time with what you know now? Oh man, it's funny. You know, I ask a similar question on my podcast and I've never asked myself this question. Um, the first thing that comes up when I think about what I would tell myself as a 20 year old. Hmm. When I was 20 years old, I just needed to hear, be yourself. And don't worry so much about the future. I was really worried about the future. I was really worried about not, not even just my own future, like the future of humanity and the planet. And uh, it stressed me out a lot. So I, I would tell myself, don't worry so much. Uh, appreciate what you have. Be grateful. Pray. And uh, prepare for an uncomfortable life. Prepare for uncomfortable conversations. Prepare for the discomfort. Uh, and this is a similar question. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who is going through a similar journey as you did? Uh, any specific part of my journey or just? Um, I would say probably the, let's say when you're in jail and, and you had to, you know, you had to deal with all of the things that came with that, your family and. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, and just to clarify, I, I spent a night in a holding cell. It was it was a very 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 low level, you know, smoking weed in public like a charge. But you know, yes, I was in a holding cell. So uh, and it, but it did bring up a lot of the same things that you're talking about. Um, so what would I tell somebody going through that type of journey? Uh, don't try not to look at it as something negative or something that's happening to you, but something that's happening for you, because that absolutely one thousand percent happened for me. All the circumstances talk about a divine occurrence. You know, I, I, could, I could tell you all the details of the story. I won't right now, but everything, how everything played out was perfect. It was so perfect how, how I was in that place at that time and how everything unfolded for me to get a really powerful lesson. So I would say somebody who is in a very difficult time, whether it is legal or it has something to do with um, suffering from addiction or depression or anxiety, whatever that dark night of the soul is for you, Find your truth, find something simple that matters to you, and be of service to someone or something outside of yourself, because that glim glimmer of light is what will help you find your way out of, your, out of the cave, out of the darkness, and um, take it one step at a time. What three books influenced you most and why? Oh, first one, um, Way of the Superior Man by David Data. Um, why did it influence me? It was the first, it was the first book. It was really a, not even the first book, the first conversation I began to have about what it could be, what it means to be a man. Um, so that one like 100% leveled me. Um, another one that really hit me, there's a lot of books, but another one that came to mind was, um, Ishmael by uh, Dan Quinn, I think is the author. It's, uh, actually that's probably, but have you read that book? Hmm. Oh, you would love that book, especially given what I've learned about you in this conversation. Um, it's, a, it's a man having a conversation with a talking gorilla, and, he, and the gorilla teaches him everything he needs to know about um, spirituality and religion, et cetera. Very interesting. And there's a follow-up to it as well. Um, what's the, I can't think of the other one, but Ishmael is the second one. I read that very early on in my 20s, and it just kind of was like, wow, this is crazy. Um, and then uh, The Warrior Within uh, is a book by, about Bruce Lee and his philosophies and his life. Bruce Lee is one of my, one of my heroes, man. Uh, talk about, if you ask me, people I'd like to have dinner with, dead or alive, Bruce Lee, man, 100%. Um, just his philosophies, the way he lived his life, how he was so unapologetically himself, how he, how he discovered how to be so unapologetically himself and what influence he continues to have because he was so committed to that uh, yeah, that's really shaped my life and who I am. Uh, so, uh, and that leads me to my next question. And I think you've answered that. Who your biggest inspiration is, is Bruce Lee. Uh, oh, I don't, I don't know if I would say Bruce. He's definitely up there, man. He's got to be like top three. Who my biggest inspiration is. Who inspires me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that it's my son. And it's my son because... He's my, he's my greatest checkpoint for how I'm doing. He's my greatest checkpoint for how I'm doing, you know, in terms of presence, in terms of my, my, my vision, my big vision, my purpose, my higher purpose. Um, he, I could just look at him. And if he feels connected to me and if he feels seen by me, then I know I've done, if I've done that right, then everything else in my life must be going well. So he, when you spit, say what inspires me, who's my inspiration, he inspires me to live into my best, to better my best every day. Um, Cause there's no hiding from him. He's right there and he sees everything and he understands it on a very, um, in a very primal way. Cause he's only three and a half years old. So yeah, he's, he's one of my, he's my biggest inspiration right now. What is your superpower? <laughs> what is my superpower uh, i think i've got a few of them man uh, i'd say my biggest superpower is my curiosity and my willingness to learn i've uh it's been reflected back to me so i know it's something that's not just my own bs story but i i often show up as the one who's willing to learn something from a conversation and not necessarily need to be right although i have that quality too um so yeah my i would say my my willingness to learn and to listen and uh, last question, if today was your last day on earth, what would you do? I would write a couple letters. I would um, maybe, maybe record a couple of videos. I have a little daughter uh, who's coming in May. So I would uh, make sure I, I, I 
save some things for her. Uh, and then I would um, see who, was it, who I was able to spend time with who was closest to me, especially my wife, my son. Um, my parents live on the other side of the country, so I don't know how feasible that would be, but probably would drive up the coast and spend some time with my best friend and his new, his new baby and, and my, my family, my extended family up there. Uh, Jetty, thank you so much for um, being so generous to connect with me. Uh, you don't know me that that much, but I'm just really, uh, really grateful. And um, yeah, I, I know the things that you do. Um, I'm just really blessed to to have you on this show. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got it, brother. And and thank you, man, for a very unexpected and very interesting conversation, man. I really, I appreciate. I, <laughs> I it down because I know that we were we were coming from different different angles of the same conversation, but I I enjoyed it. I don't know about you, but I really had a good time here. Uh, I definitely did. Thank you, and I've learned so much from you as well. Yeah, hundred percent. Right um, could you uh, tell people how they can learn from you and share a little bit about what you do? Absolutely, man. Well, anybody who wants to follow me here hear me talk some more learn more about what i what i'm up to and what i believe uh you can check me out on facebook jetty azuma instagram at jetty azuma uh, I, I make sure i announce all of what i'm up to there um big things that i'm up to are the rising man podcast so you can check it out on itunes spotify stitcher all the big ones um i also am starting to do rites of passage expeditions for men so all that information can be found at rise.jettyazuma.com so I actually forgot to ask you, what is the conscious brotherhood? The conscious man brotherhood is a council of Kings who came together and decided that it's our mission to expand consciousness for men all over the world. So, um, started by Preston. I'm one of the founding fathers. So myself, Preston smiles, um, about, I'm not going to say all the names right now, but there's about eight other men, nine other men who are part of that council. And we, so through Conscious Man Brotherhood, we do, we, we do Man Cave, we do um, events through the PAC, which is our online, free online uh, community of men. Um, that's another great resource for men out there who are just looking to connect and have honest, vulnerable conversations virtually, because not every man has a physical men's circle. So if you go to um, the PAC Brotherhood on Facebook, that's where we're at. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing is we're, we're living and growing and, and creating spaces for men to be vulnerable with each other and to grow. Uh, again, bro, thank you so much. And, um, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, love you too, you brother. And I hope to connect with you soon. Likewise, man. Yes. Look, look forward to doing that further down the road. Cool. Till next time. Right on, man. <laughs>